Okay, hello everyone, and this is David from um, Team A A Eighteen. Yes, from Team A Eighteen. Okay, so um, I'm continuing with my presentation on the three core principles of scenario planning, and now I'm doing number three, which is encourage multiple perspectives. So taking a brief recap, in the last video we talked about taking the long view. So we focus on this STEP, we focus on the political changes, we focus on macro and micro external forces. We also talk about the changes in business model and technology's impact on our business model and operations. In this video, I'm going to be talking about more of a brainstorming, the perspectives that you can contemplate about when you are, uh, when you are uh, doing scenario planning. So I hope I can keep this video more and more concise compared to the last video. I hope we, we can save you guys much more time and try to keep it more precise, you know, don't want to do, be too long lasting. Okay, so I start off with views on the global scale. So when we encourage multiple perspectives, you have to think in a global scale. It may not be so relevant for your business when you talk about global scale, but definitely you can grasp some important point in a global context that can help your business grow in the future. So for instance, you have to consider the collaboration and initiatives. So sometimes governments or different businesses, markets are having some deep collaborations and you may find a chance to do that. Some business businesses who are, a, who are tackling a a new market in a different nation may look for merger and acquisition or may look just for a partnership opportunities because for instance if I expand my business to US from China I most likely have to find someone locally so I know the market well I know how to do these corporate practices and if you are from America you might consider finding a business partner in China when you are doing business there you know so sometimes we have these collaboration opportunities that may create a win-win situation for both you can take benefits from each other and there might be initiatives. So th this collaboration initiatives can be publicly done or privately done. So it can be something that initiated by the government. Um, it can be something initiated by just by between private enterprises. And now also regulations and bar barriers. So sometimes our businesses, especially those businesses who have customers from the worldwide, customers from around the world who are also, uh, or these businesses who are collaborating with businesses around the world or buying materials, or having a global supply chain. Sometimes we have regulations and barriers. When you remember last video, we talked about international relations and political changes. Definitely they can affect it, affect this. So sometimes, you know, regulations and barriers, we have to be careful of them. We may find some ways, or if we are able to predict them, maybe we try to devise new strategies to overcome them or move on to other part or other pathways, okay? And the third point is the global market. So definitely look at the global market. It may be something that will affect the market right now for your businesses because you know many markets that doing trade the global market may be greatly linked to how your how this market as a whole will be doing it may also influence people's decision on whether they will spend a large or slow amount small amount of money on your own purchasing products from your market purchasing services from your market and so you have to look at the global market examine the conditions and make changes based on that so if the global market is performing well you know you can grasp the opportunity if it is performing badly try to uh, Try to reduce your cost or so don't incur too much external cost in your business also international relations already went through that and global business opportunities so you know so for supply chain um i'm actually personally my one of my in research interests is actually supply chain management i've been teaching a course my own on supply chain management you can check out my youtube video check out my youtube channel you should be able to find that it's about 40 videos i guess and in that video i'm talking i was talking about supply chain and i know the last chapter i was talking about is global supply chain so you know, global business opportunities and globalized supply chain talk talking them together is that many businesses are looking opportunities to expand their business worldwide. And you know, this is particularly difficult actually, it's not an easy job to expand the business worldwide and you know, but sometimes you have these great opportunities that you may succeed worldwide. And only by expanding your business it is the your first step into developing a global business and to becoming a business magnet. So definitely, you, should, you can consider about that. You can plan your globalization in the future when you do scenario planning to find out when is the best opportunity, when am I able to fulfill the requirement to do and render um, my global supply chain, and how can I find a partner, and how should I do that. So you can do some scenario planning there also, although definitely have to depend on the future as well. Okay, and global opportunities as well by doing trade definitely between different countries, trade between different market, definitely there are possible opportunities for you. And moreover, talking about emerging markets, so certain markets may be emerging, not only developed countries, 
uh, emerging markets usually can be spotted in especially developing countries and even 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 uh, worst worstly developing countries you know how to say this so emerging market definitely um sometimes there are great opportunities there and especially when you are making investment if you are considering investment making you can diversify your portfolio by investing in certain emerging market because emerging markets actually have high risk which means it may drop to a certain low point but it also has more potential possibly than this already developed economies like sweden switzerland finland um this particular countries because they already have a developed economy they're relatively stable while emerging economies like china brazil india they kind of have a drastic change it may go up pretty high it may go down pretty fast it may go up pretty fast and the drastic change kind of thing so definitely you can consider emerging market as well but definitely in order to reduce the risk and find out and tackle and intrude in the best when when it's a, when it is the best time for you to go on you should do careful signal planning and research before you make uh, and take this step forward okay and moreover talking about step model so i already introduced you guys the step model in uh, last video but definitely when you are in car when we are encouraging ourselves to scenario plan to plan a scenario in multiple perspectives definitely as the ep something we have we have to get in touch with uh, for long for a lot of time that i um yeah i know you guys i uh, think you guys know what uh, we do this alpha best actually indicate and um my point the same thing that i want to emphasize this factor really correlate interconnect to each other and although it state model is only one part from this whole diagram you are looking at right now but however you know everything's linked to the step model when we're predicting our business because we're living in our world and these five factors are these most important factors and may sometimes the weighting of a particular factor the importance may be lower so as right now i think environment is not so much an issue people are all caring about lives and so for some sometimes social may not be a particular issue for sometimes politics is relatively stable but definitely we're working with this playing around with these factors every day in our lives if we're operating a business because we're in touch with all these five points of view okay in touch with all these five factors when we are operating our business so you can also scenario plan pl uh, these five factors in the time you want to plan like five years two years something ten years okay also now um, i want to particularly introduce just in case in this video is that um i know if you um uh, i know if you're watching this video just by a youtube audience you know uh, you might not know but the professor watson in summer program is professor maro guelan of management has been emphasizing that just in case is a strategy that has emerged from COVID-19. So from the COVID-19 pandemic, just in case has been something that many companies find out they have to be equipped with in order to kind of stable and survive in the market. So they can include examples, uh, can be backup and secondary plans. So these plans can be how you're going to carry out work while still at home, uh, not able to physically meet your client, not able to physically de delegate and cooperate, uh, co collaborate, coordinate tasks between different departments. So you have to have certain secondary plans to prepare for the pandemic. Um, sensing for even if the pandemic is not here, you have to have secondary plans because you know market uncertainty is high. So when the market performs at a particular standard, you may have a plan. When the market performs worsely, when the market is in a pessimistic point of view or optimi when the market is optimistic, you may have different plans as well. So just in case it's something not only not only in pandemic and you may you may be something that you have to be careful with. You have to pay attention in um, for the just for your normal business operations term. And second thing is actually implementing automations is that sometimes we find out that automation not only help us to increase our efficiency, but it also enables us to work. And for instance, in a pandemic, in certain sometimes factories not closed down, it enables us to continue our processes. So we find out that in the pandemic, many workers, especially in Singapore, we have a lot of dormitory workers have to be quarantined. Same thing for the US. So definitely, uh, you know, automation actually allows us work to continue if we still have orders and we're not able to have our manpower working in the factory group together or we have to, we, or we only can have a certain percentage of our workforce, like 10, 20%, then automation really helps us. So not only in pandemic as well, automation is can be a plan um, that may be implemented into your company. As I, I mentioned just now in my last video, that technology can impact your business model, technology can impact your business operations. And then also I work at home measures. So I don't, I know it's pretty easy to understand this word. Uh, everybody knows it, everybody feels it, especially your parents work at home during this pandemic. You all know the feeling of them. Yeah, so basically we have to be prepared for the pandemic. Not only that, we have to prepare for any sickness. If some person is sick, we still have to carry out important, uh, important work. So we have to implement work at home measures, not only for the pandemic, but in case there's some accident, there's some important managers who's sick or someone who's pregnant, but we still need to contact with them to follow on with our work to make large business decisions that are worth a lot of value. Then maybe we have to consider on uh, work at home measures. 
And moreover, and moreover, we may also have work at home measures for those talent search. I mentioned uh, virtual teams that I mentioned in the last video that sometimes we may have to employ people who just work at home or work in a different nation geographically. They may work in a coffee shop, may work at their villa, may work in a hotel. But this work at home or work uh, work at different place measure, virtual team measure is also something that may your business may consider in the future in a virtual team point of view that you don't have to pay the rent, don't have to pay the money to bring this person from another continent possibly to, or another country to your office. So you can save your cost and maybe it, it, it is also op opening a pathway for you as a business manager to employ talents because sometimes you have these talents but they are they don't they want to stay with their families and not willing to actually move their whole family back to wherever you you are now so by by having virtual team although i know efficiency can be an issue but also you are not meeting people physically so in terms of motivation and rigid measures i'm not sure whether it can be achieved and so that's why virtual teams won't be a problem in my prediction in the near future however for certain job positions people have to work at home and they believe there can be higher efficiency there such as programmers if you see gaming programmers that work at home, some social media influencers work at home, some uh, e-commerce managers, e-commerce business owners work at home as well. Especially on those technical technical work side. Uh, you know, the marketing side, account management side, more of those who are required to work on site to keep in touch with the customers, and those who are on a more of a technical point of view, working with technologies, uh, most likely this, this portion of people have a larger chance to work at home. Okay, and now I want to talk about, uh, now less two points make, uh, less three, I mean, okay, so we talk about human resources first. Okay, so human resources, we start with a incentive alignment. So human resources, I know incentives, I know for you, you might not be a happy thing that you are giving more and more money to your employees. You want, keep, you want to keep more money inside your pocket, but definitely you have to prepare for that as well because, you know, psychology, business psychology is important. One of my research interests is business psychology is that you have to be careful with your employees motivation so and what comes with motivation is actually incentive alignment by giving incentive alignment you're able to provide incentives to um, able to provide a kind of motivate your workers and definitely it is also requiring senior planning because incentives can be can come in different format from between now and the future it may be different and also um, you can also divide innovative ways to pr provide incentive rather than just providing more money so you can think about better ways to motivate these workers and um, by achieving this, uh, by doing this, you can also ensure that you can also consult uh, experts, uh, psycho business psychology experts or just psychology experts, human resources experts, advisors, consultants to find out what are the ways to employ better incentive alignments while you can save a lot of money, but you can also successfully motivate your workers to have their full commitment to your company or at least, at least a considerably amount of acceptable commitment to the company. Okay, and next step onward is coordination communications. So this is pretty difficult to ensure coordination communications between employees and company, between different departments. Even though this is more of a daily issue, but it also requires new planning because sometimes before, for instance, now I'm planning for next year's project. Next year, my companies will be undertaking a project for a Sweden, for instance, then we have to be prepared. If we start right away and we think about how do we coordinate or how do we communicate back after the product starts, we are likely to fail because we're not able to cope with the chaos. It will be pretty chaotic. So remember to also plan how you're going to coordinate, what are the methodologies of communications, and also combine them with incentives, delegate the task well, and set up backup plans, um, secondary plans, so you can kind of stabilize your future project, okay? And then the sec third point is future workforce demand. Then as last video I talked about, the some occupations may, be, uh, may have to be made redundant. You know, definitely future works, workforce demand, um, you have to plan this so you're able to grasp and actually get the talents you want. And also you're saving costs from these positions, occupations that you don't think you want anymore. Uh, for instance, uh, no matter it's because of technologies, automations, replacement, or because you don't feel like this is important, or you, you, can, provide, you can provide bonuses for another employee to, do, to actually do this job. Yeah, so that can be the case as well. Okay, and lastly, workflow innovations. Workflow basically refers to the operations of a company. It can be a production, just operations management. It can be your daily office work. It can be how your, how your uh, manufacturing is carried out. Basically, there can be innovations. So I'll discuss that in, um, actually in my next video that I'll talk about that cross-team functioning approach and uh, traditional approach. These are two different approaches that well, one is actually traditional, one is innovative. So you can think about, I can inspire you with some workflow uh, innovative ideas. 
Okay, moving on to our last two parts before we end this video today and call it a day. Uh, we're going to go through the private sector and the public sector. So in terms of public sector, we have um, public sector, we can break it down into four parts. The first thing is government stakeholders in intervention. So government stakeholders, you know, they are these external stakeholders, for instance, environment agency, they can be uh, environmental department, environmental bureau, financial bureau, uh, law bureau, they, they may care a lot about your company. So government really care about that. So you have to make sure and plan what the stakeholders, government stakeholders are looking at and how you can actually get benefits or actually do not get losses from the intervention of the government. For instance, some government may want you to reach a certain percentage of renewable energy production, so you have to be prepared and plan to how to, for that. So you have to think how can you achieve that. Yeah, so these are examples of government stakeholders' intervention. Also, the government stakeholders may intervene you positively. They may want to provide you subsidies. So you have to perform and actually develop and showcase the points that they are looking at, showcase their prospects. So you can display to them that, oh, my company has been achieving this, and I think I meet the standard of your subsidies, I meet the standards of your uh, of your incentives, and uh, I think they can help me a lot. And they also benefit the society, benefit employment, and benefit the development of a certain domain, something like that. Okay, the second point is policies, regulations, and incentives. Yeah, I talked about incentives already, and definitely policies, plan that so you can actually follow these policies and try to benefit from these policies. Or if policies are setting restrictions or bar barriers to you, try to explore new pathways before you actually experience problems and losing a lot of money. Okay, and also lastly, investments and budget. So I mentioned actually from the last video, the government has a direction because it has it has like a different basket, a different basket that they are spending the budget on. So for instance, this year, government may be spending a larger, relatively larger portion of its budget on medical development, on medical medication help and society development of societal welfare to be provided to those people losing their jobs. And in the past, maybe something different in the past, um, the government, you know, government may provide money for technological development, so it can be different fields. Okay, okay so that is about this point. Okay, continue on and lastly we want to talk about budget and investment so I've talked about a budget is that I, I mentioned already the government always cared uh, how much to invest for particular business but however a particular market but in terms of the budget what we're thinking about is our uh, investment we're thinking about is government actually also invest in businesses although you mean government also needs money by achieving bonds but it also wants to invest to other companies as well Charging. Charging well. So in this case, in this case, since the government needs to invest, you may grasp opportunities of this investment as well. Okay. Okay. Lastly, the private sector. So the public sector is focused on government and government organizations, and a uh, private sector focuses on private enterprises. So supply chain management strategies under uh, private sector is really important because we know if you, uh, no company actually exists as one company. You know, Apple has its product produced by Foxconn back in. Guangdong, uh, South China. No, so um, you know, a company may be popular, may be successful, but the success is determined by how well as it is it coordinating its supply chain, how well, how efficient, how responsive is the supply chain going. So supply chain, uh, um, I can make one video specially discussing this because I'm actually my, that's my research interest, and I actually spent I've been spending a lot of time from April to May researching supply chain management. But just by um, giving you a brief understanding, if you are not sure about what is supply chain, is that it basically comprises as as a supplier, manufacturer, distributor, and the customer. So it starts from the pro, pro, start from the process where the products are produced. I mean, start from the process where the raw materials are provided, and then we manufacture the product, and then we distribute them possibly by logistic, possibly in retail shop, and then selling sell them to the customers. And this means, you know, you already see three different participants: supplier, manufacturer, and distributor. Before the product gets to the customer, there can be more and more players inside. At least three players or maybe for some companies there can be only two if the manufacturer com is combined with distributor or manufacturer combined with supplier but definitely you know you have to be well coordinated with the supply chain so you have to predict and predict the future forecast that how you can ensure that you can coordinate your supply chain well what are some management strategies that I'll actually go through later such as vendor managed inventory and so on they can actually help you to ensure efficiency, ensure your supply chain is going relatively well, you're able to implement your plan, execute your production, and actually sell your product at the right time in the market. Second thing to emphasize is innovations on business models. I mentioned in the last video that business model may innovate, especially along with the tech development going on these days. And third thing is market transformation. So you have you might have to turn your market. Your, so, uh, so yeah, the market may have different potential in the future, and certain market may have monopolies that you might feel like, oh, I want to exist the market. 
I want to turn my product and transform my product a bit, or you might completely transform your product and change your product type, change your direction of your business. So this is a market transformation, or we can say it's kind of also a business model transformation. So you have to plan carefully, maybe you have to enter a new market, where you think there are more opportunities ahead, and you may succeed. Here. And the fourth thing is emerging market, I've discussed that already, and this market is basically a market that, this basically a market that may fill with opportunities in the future, maybe a new market for private businesses that they can explore for the potential. And then shareholders demand and perspectives, in terms of shareholders, how much product do they, in terms of shareholders demand is like, how are shareholders looking at how provide you with investment if they see revenue, but now they may have to see some new aspects such as innovations, that has cash flow and so on and so forth, such as your organizational structure, such as your potential. So, you know, try to provide and showcase shareholders what they want. So then you can it's, um, showcase that what, you, what they want. So you're tackling their demand, then there's higher chance for you, your business to obtain investments. Lastly, organizational structures. You know, private sector business is important. You know, there can be shapes, transformations of your organizational structures in terms of human resources, in terms of how, for instance, a decentralized structure from centralized to decentralized to increase your efficiency, to increase your motivation, to increase emotion, psychology of your workers, or it's also probable that you can implement such a uh, more tech-oriented organizational structure, more digital, tech, uh, digital organizational structure as well. So you have a lot of ideas behind. Okay, so this is pretty multiple perspectives to give you guys some ideas. You guys can bring still more and more so we can actually kind of uh, be filled with different factors and ideas before you considering before you consider your senior planning. So I hope you guys like this video. Hope this video can help you with senior planning and I'll see you guys in the future. Bye.